What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It is, isn't it? I tell you, it is. Because where I was uh, uh, 45 minutes ago, you won't want to get too close to me today because uh, I was cleaning out some barns. So I probably don't smell too good this morning. <laughs> so it is a joy to be here instead of there this morning. Uh, November 1st, Food Pantry, remember that. Uh, there's a... Some need back there, get with Joan, uh, but it's been being filled very quickly, so we thank everyone for that that's been involved in that. Uh, I spoke with uh, Regina yesterday. She said to tell everybody hi, and that they're doing great, and that they do worship with us every Sunday morning. They said when we, at 1030 our time, wherever they are, they listen to last week's service on the internet. So they're a week behind, but they're still worshiping with us. So she wanted to know that they miss y'all, and thank you for the prayers and thinking about y'all. And uh, She's still worshiping with us every Sunday morning, so we're just grateful that they're able to do that. I don't have any other announcements at the time, so let's just go to the Lord in song number 45. Crown him with many crowns. show he is worthy to be called king in our life and we do adore him so number 191 father we adore thee Show that by laying your life before him. Number 193, is the Lord good to you? God is so good, he's so good to me. Amen. God is 
said his son to that old rugged cross to die for our sins. Number 327, the old rugged cross. his amazing grace for us that he would die for such a sinner as I number 343 amazing grace
Praises to the Lord. And, and Dickie asked me, he said, did, did you do the bulletin already? And I already had, and had it printed and everything. And he said, man, I really want to add a song. So I thought, what better way to add a song that he wants to emphasize that he's going to sing the sermon than to sing it for you, but without the piano. And just take some time. To listen to the words, sometimes I think we just start singing the songs and we don't take time to really understand what we're singing and we just sing them. So the song is one we all know and we sing it often is I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story. and his love. I love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I to tell the story it did so much for me and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee I love to tell the story my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant. 
present to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love beautiful song you know sometimes when we hear a story over and over again you know that's just an old story I've heard it before it's not an old old story it's a new story every day and it should enlighten us and, and, and amplify our life but you know there's some that says that never even heard and to them it's not an old story it's a new one brother Dickie come bless us with God's word Good morning. That is a beautiful story. And it just happens to be what we're going to be looking at this morning and speaking upon. But before we get started, let's go to the Lord in the word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, before I speak any more, please may the Holy Spirit take control of this service. God, that you would push me out, that the Holy Spirit would reside, that the Holy Spirit would be within this place. God, we need to hear from you. We live in a world that has just gone completely nuts, that is corrupted in so many ways. We need that fresh vision. We need that fresh word. We need to realize and to tell those that do not know the old, old story of Jesus. And his love. Father, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the part that it plays in my life. I'm thankful for these people that you bless me with. God, that you have surrounded me with. How life could be so empty without Christ. How we just don't even know which way to turn. We don't even know how to act without looking into the word of God and seeing what you have spoken to us. Father, knowing that you have already given us the way that you want us to go, 
And too many times we find disobedience at our own doorstep. Father, bring the obedience back into the lives of your people. May this message bring you honor, bring you glory. May it help us to realize there are those that are perishing. And God, we are the ones that are standing in front of them. But what do we have to say? What do we tell them? Father, all this in the glory, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. On a little bit of a light side, first, before we get started, I've got good news and i got bad news. So Everybody usually likes the good news first. But I'm going to give you the bad news first. I have 15 pages. 15 pages. And I did a little arithmetic this morning. And I figured if I spent one minute on each page, we would have a 15-minute service. If I spent three minutes, oh, it's a 45-minute service. Well, we're going to go on. If I spend five minutes on each page, that is a grand total of 75 minutes. And then if we went 10 minutes a page, we have 115 minutes. So the good news is I do have my conclusion sheet that I can use and insert it at any point. <laughs> so that's the good news. But the bad news is, and I, I really thought about, well, I was a little reluctant to maybe share that with you because, you know what, these people are going to be thinking, hmm, well, let's see, how long, how long did he spend on that first page? Well, let's see, that's five, that's ten minutes. Well, no, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, that's on the light side. Now, what we're going to look at this morning, part of this is in pretty much a format of each printed sheet that appears to look like this right here. And we're going to go through it. And the reason I have done this and the reason I am, am doing this is my thought process is not what it used to be. And it's really embarrassing to come up here and, and, and try to preach and then all of a sudden forget what you're going to preach. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad, you know? So this helps. This kind of keeps me in line. It keeps me from chasing rabbits and all this kind of stuff. So, anyway, this uh, title is Rescuing the Perishing. In the, world of, in the world of eschatology, we see the part of theology. That is a part of theology that is concerned with death, judgment, and the final destination of the soul and that is what we need to look at this morning we have only two final places that we will go to that's it either you'll spend your time in hell or you'll spend your time in heaven and that's it that's the only two places that we can choose and many people today are choosing hell but the problem is, we're the ones that are supposed to help rescue the perishing. That is our part to do. And if we don't do our part, then I am afraid that many, many, many more will find themselves into the place that is called hell. We can notice the extreme opposition of the two. We cannot for a moment concentrate or envision how beautiful heaven really is. We cannot do that. Our mind is not able to have that type of concept to realize how beautiful heaven is. But on the extreme opposition, nor can we begin to realize how awful and how terrible the place of hell is. And those that are spending their life in there. So we have extreme contrast. Beautiful, wonderful, terrible, hurtful, destructive. 
This is the two oppositions. This is a message about remembrance. This is a message about awareness. This is a message about obedience. We must remember those that are lost. We must be obedient to go and to teach them, to bring them, to take them the word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they too can enter into that wonderful, beautiful place that we call heaven and escape the damnation of hell. We need to cultivate and we need to captivate our own personal testimony to those that are in need. I realize this is an older generation church that does not keep us from speaking the words that we know our own testimony the day that we became saved the day that that story changed our lives that day anybody can share their own personal testimony and possibly hopefully help those that are perishing. That is what we need to be doing. Perishing has the thought of separation through spiritual death. With a, when a person perishes, they find themselves being destroyed through violence and sometimes suddenly. Two examples we have. First example is in the days of Noah. The Bible said that the wickedness was so great that the imagination of the people's heart was evil continually. Continually. And God said, I repent of myself that I ever made man. It grieved him in his heart. And he said, you know what? I will destroy them. So we see right here at the very beginning God also has a wrathful side of him. It's not what the world is thinking today. It's God is love. God is love. God is love. Yeah, God is love. But God also has a wrathful side. And the people that are in hell are on that side of God, which is his wrathful side. And we need to realize that. The love that God shed abroad in our hearts with Jesus Christ is the same that we need to spread and to share with the others that do not know Christ. Then the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is an example of violence. A violent death. They all suffered a violent death of fire and brimstone. That's pretty violent. And so we see two examples, both perished, both perished, both the generation of Noah perished and the, the generation that Sodom and Gomorrah, those people, they perished. One was violently and the other was because their hearts were evil continually. And that is what we have today in society. You look around and you see evilness all around. And we need to carry that message to those people. This is a sobering message. It's where the rubber indeed meets the road. Understanding grows into knowledge and knowledge develops into wisdom. Wisdom brings us face to face with truth. Truth sheds light upon the state of reality. And reality then convicts us towards awareness. What is that all? What, what, is that, what does that say? It simply says that we have been enlightened. We have the word of God within us that tells, that shows, that, that exemplifies Christ within us. We have that. We are the ones that have that. The people of the world do not have that. 
They don't have a clue about that. We are the chosen ones that are to carry that gospel to those that are perishing. That is what we need to be aware of. And we need to have it with a love and a concern in our hearts that we really care. We care about where these people are going to spend the rest of their eternity. Because if it's not in heaven, then it's in hell. We must, regardless of what it takes, take them the gospel. And while we're looking at this message, if you would like your Bibles, I'm sure some of you have them, and you can be finding the scripture there, eventually we will get there. And it is in Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12, is the inspiration for this message. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. We will look at it in some detail. And matter of fact, we will look at it also in several different translations. Because it is so important. So important. When considering those that are perishing, should not each and every one of us that holds the doctrine of salvation's truth have the awareness and apply the means of obedience in rescuing the perishing? We all were perishing at one time. Every one of us was perishing. But because of the grace of God, someone reached their hand out. Someone took the gospel to us. Somehow the Holy Spirit touched our lives. And we, we became saved. And our eyes were open and our ears could hear. And so that is what we must take to those that do not know the gospel. We look around, folks. I know it's a small congregation, but each one of us has the responsibility of taking this gospel to those that are perishing. We were all just one heartbeat away from hell. One heartbeat. I realized that I could have died before the gospel ever got to my life. I was 21 years old. Plenty of time for me to die in between that. Many people do die before 21. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. The Lord gave me a long enough time that I saw the light. And this was an individual. This was an individual. Shared the gospel. How wonderful was that gospel. To my ears and to my heart, that salvation. My one man, Adam, came sin, and sin brought with it the introduction to hell's possibilities. But then there was one man, Christ Jesus, him from above. He also brought with him the possibilities of being in heaven forever as well. Hell is not figurative. Hell is not metaphorical. Hell is not symbolical. Hell is not poetical. Hell is real. Real. Millions of people are in it today. People are in it as I speak to you right now. Burning in hell. They are there with no escaping. None. On an average, there are 56 million deaths a year worldwide. 56 million deaths a year. I did some research. I looked that up on the world clock of death. You know there was such a thing as that? Yeah. And I broke it down. 56 million a year. 153,424 70 a day, 6,392 an hour, and 106 people a minute are dying in this world. And we are the ones to stand in the gap. And to be sure that we carry the gospel to all of those that we can. 
Because if we don't, then we know what the outcome is. We know what the Word of God says. That they will perish. And they will stagger their lives down to hell. And they will never, never see the grace of God, the mercy of God, again, the light of God. They are there. And they are in the darkness. And they are trembling. And they are in fear. And they have crying and weeping and gnashing of teeth. They have all these things that they are faced with in this bottomless pit of hell. That is what they are facing. And they are those that are there now facing that. That have no hope. No hope. But we are their hope as they live. As they live. We are their hope. And we could be their only hope. That we can show them through the way of Christ. The scripture says, therefore, thinking of the, the numbers of people, 56 million a year that die. Therefore, hell, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and all that rejoices shall descend into it. Isaiah 5, 14. Hell hath enlarged herself. Isn't that many people going into hell? That hell has to enlarge itself? Though thus saith the word, yes. Even in the days of Noah, there was a number of some two million or more people that died in the flood. That is the numbers that, that someone had forecasted back then. That many people, over a couple million people, only eight righteous no one in the family. Everybody else perished. They all died. And as in the days of Noah, so shall the Son of Man be. Are we that other generation? Are we like the days of Noah? Are there so many people that have strayed from the God that their hearts are only evil thinking continually? Is there no goodness even left in them? Are we that close? Are we on that brink of disaster for them in their lives? What is the value of rescuing just one soul? One soul. What is the worth? To that person that gets saved. Oh, there is nothing more important. There is nothing greater. There is nothing more superior than to know, to make that decision that you know, that you know that Christ is your Savior and that you are saved from the flames and the torment of hell. You will never, ever even come close to that place. What is that worth, folks? Glory be to God. I know what it's like that I do not have to. To endure that. Never. Never. Because of the grace of God. Hell is no joke. A lot of people like to think it's a joke. Hell's not a joke. Hell is real. If there is no hell, there is no heaven. There is no salvation. There is no resurrection. There is no life after death. And to take it one step further, there is no Savior and there is no God. And we are all just victims and subjects of the stupid ideal of evolution. No, God forbid. Yes, there's a hell. Yes, there's a heaven. Yes, there's a God. Yes, there's a Savior. The Bible speaks to every one of those. And every one of those are true. Because God's word is the final authority. If we are going to accept heaven. And we're going to accept the wonderful attributes of heaven. Then we must also realize that hell is just as real. 
And people are finding themselves in it daily. 50 some million people a year. How many of those are going to hell? How many of those are going to heaven? God help us. Remove our blinders. Give us hearing aids if that's what we need. But we must go and we must seek those that are lost. That they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us understanding, knowledge, wisdom, truth. And so let us take those attributes and let us apply them. Let us be aware of what is around us. One day I was thinking and I just had a thought. And maybe you can help me with it. Would you rather have all the knowledge of the word of God and very, very little application? Or would you rather have just, just a little bit of the word of God, like say maybe the gospel? Just have that, but have complete application on that. What would be more important? All the knowledge, no application, little knowledge, gospel, Full application. It's got to be the full application of what we know. We continually think we got to keep knowing and knowing and knowing. We don't even use what we got. We got to start using what we already know, what we got. Brother Pete, he was so gracious to sing the song. I love to tell the story. And I didn't know how it was all going to turn out. But I've got the words right there. I love to tell the story. Because you know what? It's so important to, to, to take time, as Brother Pete said, to look at those words, digest those words, and put them in the heart. Because they're so valuable. They're so valuable to our testimony. It is what it's all about. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. Because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing. As nothing else could do. Isn't that true? Isn't that so true? The words of that song. Just the words of that song should be enough to move us. You know, I, I could have almost just... Brother Pete, God bless you. Amen. You're dismissed. I'm serious. It was so good. It was so wonderful. Those words are so, so precious, so valuable to our lives. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, t'will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. Some of you have loved that song for a lot of years. I can tell by the color of your hair. You can tell by the color of my hair. I love that song. So many times I do not act upon the message of the song. Too many times I just get in my own little world and I just live my own world. Now, me and God, we share it, but, you know, God wants me to share his story. That's what he wants. We that are, we that are saved have received everything through life eternal. We are guaranteed and sealed to the day of redemption through the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, never more to worry about the destination of hell's reality, never having to worry about that. The Bible teaches that the wrath of God will be upon each and every one of those who die in their sins. All the fierceness of anger and wrath will come upon those who die without Christ. And once that happens, it is not reversible. It is permanent. 
It is fixed in concrete. There is no way out. There are millions of people right now that are gambling with their destiny. Only a moment away from experiencing an existence of damnation where their worm dieth not. A few words to pass on that we find in the Word of God. Everlasting fire, everlasting punishment, weeping and gnashing of teeth, submerged into the deepest darkness of loneliness. And after a million years, they will realize that it is just now getting started. As we consider that introduction, and I hope you hadn't forgot about Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. With that introduction, let us prayerfully enter into the text scriptures, which brings us to Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Four different translations, numerous realizations of truth. Save the lost, intervene on their behalf. Refrain from restraining ourselves. That's a good one. Let's, let's, let's look at that for just a second. Let me, listen to me. Refrain from restraining ourselves. Now, that is simply saying too many times we refrain ourselves in restraining ourselves. We don't want to restrain ourselves when it comes to the gospel. That is the one thing that we openly, freely want to do. Do not restrain or refrain from that. I don't know what translation you have, but chances are you're going to have one of these because we're looking at four of them. The very first one is found in the New American Standard Bible. The Word of God says in the New American Standard Bible, Deliver those who are being taken away to death. And we're going to break that down in just a moment. And those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And he will not render, and will he not render to man according to his works? First of all, deliver those who are being taken. Those that are being taken. It is those that are deceived. It is those that are lured. It is those that are pulled. It is those that are attracted by Satan himself. That is the ones that are being taken. We are to deliver those that are being taken. Deceived by Satan through their own lust. Listen to what James says in 1.14. But. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed from the world. Now that reminds us of Romans 12, 1 and 2, does it not? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. These people are being lured away through their own lust in what the world is providing. That is the problem. And what we have to do is interject ourselves into that conversation and say, wait a minute, this is not what you need in this life. This is what you need. This is Christ. This is the world. You cannot serve God and mammon. We know that. I know you know that. We know that. But the thing about this message is we need to remember. We need to remember these things. What is it going to take 
to stir our hearts. That we have that burning sensation within us. That we just must tell somebody about Jesus. What will it take? Gosh, I've heard so many, so many sermons in my life. I've even gave a few sermons from him, you know, from time to time. But too many times we walk away and we don't change. We hear it, but we don't do anything about it. And I just wonder, I, 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 I just have to wonder, God, what is it? What do we need to do? What do we need to do to get on fire for Jesus? Couldn't we make a difference then if we did that? Couldn't we change some people's lives? I don't know of anybody that's in here right now that if, if that gospel hadn't been taken to you, you wouldn't even be sitting in here. You'd be out in the world somewhere. You'd be doing something else like Romans 12, 1 and 2 was talking about. You'd be conforming to the world. And then we want to get into that because we don't have time because I'm taking 10 minutes a sheet <laughs> as, as it is. And so we can't do that. But that's the people of God that can also conform to the world. And that, But that's not the message right now. The message is... We need enough love and concern in our hearts to take the message to those that are dying. Now, that is the translation of the New American Standard. It gets better, folks. I mean, it really gets better. Let me back up for, before we move on because I have uh, circled this on that scripture. It says, oh, oh, like, oh, my goodness, oh, hold them back. Hold them back. Please. It's just saying be the salt and be the light of the world. Oh, oh, Christian, Christian, hold them back. Grab a hold of them. Don't let them go. Hold them back. Because if they ever go, if they're ever let loose, if God ever cuts the thread that they're dangling by, if that ever happens, it'll be too late. You cannot reach down and pull them back. And if it happens to be one of your brothers or sisters or mothers or dads or a friend or a co-worker or whoever it is or a stranger, and that you, if you're able to touch them, if you're able to reach them for Christ, then you have saved that soul from ever being into the pits of hell. Oh, it's nothing any more important than that. Nothing. I always, years ago, I knew I made the greatest and the wisest and the best decision that I could ever make. And that was when I accepted Christ as Savior. That was the best decision, I mean, over everything in my life. My wife, my job, my whatever. Whatever it is, nothing is greater than that decision that was made for Christ that The New King James Version. And it's a little different reading. That's why I took all four of them. It says, deliver those who are drawn towards death. Deliver. Deliver. What does that say? What is, what is that telling us? Deliver is when you take something to someone. When you hand something to someone. You're delivering. Delivering. What are we to deliver? What are we to deliver in light of the scripture? The gospel. The gospel. That is what we need to deliver. That is what's going to save them. That's what's going to set them on the, 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 the path to heaven. That. Deliver. Take it over. Take them. The gospel. Those who are drawn to death. Deliver the gospel to those that are drawn to death. And hold back. Hold back those that are stumbling to the slaughter. They're headed that way. They're headed that direction. Hold them back. Surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? I have heard so many times 
God would never do that to people. He would never do that to his creation. He would never slaughter them. God is strictly love. That is not the case. You know how I know that's not the case? Because God slaughtered his own son. You realize that? Sure you do. You've been in church long enough. You've been in the Word long enough. God slaughtered his own son. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears was dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Yeah. The other scripture... He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And he opened not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous service justify many because he shall bear their iniquities. God's righteousness demanded and required the death of his own son. God slaughtered his own son so that we could go free. So you're going to tell me that he is not going to slaughter the millions and the millions of those who die in their sins? Yes, he is. That is the wrathful side of God. And that is what those people have to look forward to. If you're not on the loving side of God. What other side are you on? The wrathful side of God. That is the other side. The same thing. The good side of God. Heaven. The wrathful side of God. Hell. Heaven. Hell. Heaven. Hell. It's amazing. Just two places. Just two places to go. That's it. And each one of us is going to find ourselves in one or the other. I'm not through with that part on God had sacrificed his own son, slaughtered his own son. Y'all are familiar with Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from Helping me. And from the words of my roaring. This is Jesus. This is his son speaking. This is the words of his son. And most people believe that he recited it while he was upon the cross. Oh my God. I cry unto thee in the daytime and thou hearest not. And in the night season and am not silent. But thou... Thou art holy, O thou, that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and they were not confounded. They trusted in thee. But I am a worm, a no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out their lip. They shake their head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him. He endured it all so that none would have to perish. God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God's not sending anybody to hell. They're sending themselves. God has done everything he possibly needed to do plus more. When he sent his son to the cross to die for us. That conclusion sheet is definitely will be, have to be moved up. And then we have the scripture in, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. When we think about all that God did so that we would not have to face the destruction of hell. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. 
and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So what does that say to us? Jesus, that made it so clear. Does that not say to us, rescue the perishing at all costs? Rescue those that are perishing. And then we have good old King James Version translation. This is my translation that I love. What a different twist it puts on it. Listen to these words. If you have the King James, you already know. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? There is so much information in that scripture right there. From top to bottom. Let's go from bottom to top. To render every man. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done. Whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 And so we know you know, I know, from the Word of God, it says in this sheet, it is a very colorful sheet. This sheet right here, you look at it, and it has so much detail just on this scripture right here. We will be guilty because we know what the Word of God says. We will be standing in judgment for what we do or do not do. This is not for sins. Christ took care of that for all that are saved. But we will be judged according to that which we have done. Whether it be good or bad. To forbear. You know what that word means, forbear? It means to restrain an impulse. To restrain an impulse. Have you ever done that? Have you ever restrained an impulse? And what that is saying, what that is really speaking of is, have you ever had the Holy Spirit nudge you about something? And I, I, I liken it as far as an example to myself is you may be somewhere, you may be out, you may be at a store, you may be wherever. And all of a sudden, you have this conviction, this nudge, about going and talking to a person and talking to a person about salvation, carrying them the gospel. You don't know this person. This is just a person. But yet you have that. You have that nudge. And then you just kind of look around. You look around and you think about it. You know, and oh, no, what that, people, that person's going to think I'm crazy. I don't know who that is. They're going to look at me like, yeah, ain't he a weirdo or something? But that's what this is saying. That's what forbear is. When we have that nudge and we refuse to do something about it, then we are guilty. We are guilty. Because that is what we're supposed to. It says, if thou forbear, if you, if I restrain an impulse to do something, if we hold back, from delivering, now look at the wording of this. If you, I, restrain to deliver or to take the good news to them that are dying, those that are ready to be slain, and we've looked at that. If we do that, we are guilty. We're guilty. That is just like putting our blood on them or their blood on us. That would be the correct translation. Their blood upon us. And I can't imagine when Paul said that he was, was free of the guilt of, of the blood of all men. Well, wow. that's great. But that is what we need to look at and consider this morning. 
If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn into death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? You know, the Lord in Ezekiel tells us, not Ezekiel, but in Ecclesiastes, the preacher said, I will bring every work and every secret thing into judgment. And so we this morning that have heard this message, we will be guilty if we do not do according to what the Word of God says. And that is something that we should consider to bring all of this to a conclusion and pull the conclusion sheet up a few, we will have just a dose of scriptures that I will read that will present, I hope, this message with clarity, reality, and brutality. Clarity, reality, brutality. Three reasons to rescue the perishing. Jesus speaking, and I will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 18, 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven in order to warn men of its reality. And that's a quoted statement from John MacArthur. It's part of his book, The Ultimate Religious Decision. Jesus speaking. And then he will also say to those that are on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away, Jesus speaking, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And in conclusion of this morning's message, what can be said that has not already been said? What else can my heart bear to you that has not already been bared? How can I help each one of us to see the need of saving those that are lost, those that are perishing? What other tactic, what other means should I share to increase the perishing's awareness? What will it take for our hearts to hurt enough to care for those that are staggering to eternal death? Who will commit to the longevity of sharing the old, old story of Jesus and his love, of Jesus and his glory? It is my theme and glory to tell the old, old story. Those that are staggering and those that are drawn towards eternal death are on a foundation and hang from the strength of a very thin thread thread is any of us committed enough to rescue them before God's uncertainty of time runs out and the thread breaks plunging them into eternal damnation six questions but only one answer here am I Lord send me here am I Lord send me let us pray. Father, God, give us strength. We are surrounded and we seem to just get intertwined with the things and the, the value of this world when all that is really important is that the people understand and realize and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What else can be more important for with Jesus? You have everything. You have a life that you can live on this earth and then that grand life of heaven when it is our time to go. Father, I pray that you will help us to retain the thoughts of this message 
that we can think back and we can remember that there's so many people, 58 million people die every year. What part can we do to help those that are dying to be sure that their home is in heaven and not the torment and the, and the damnation of hell? Father, be with Brother Pete. Be with this church, the undertaking that it has, the position that it has. May it make a strong stand for the power of Christ. May you bless each one of these people. Father, I thank you for allowing them to be here. I thank you for allowing me to be here. And Father, I hope and I pray that you receive the honor and the glory from this message this day, for that is all that is important. And it is in the powerful name and the saving grace of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Brother Pete. Thank you, sir. This morning, just remain seated. Flo, go ahead and play. If you're not convicted this morning after that message, on what we need to be doing as Christians, playing the song do not pass me by if, if you haven't surrendered to that gift that he spoke of that Jesus gave don't let the spirit pass you by this morning respond but if not just take the time this morning I have to ask the Lord to forgive me for all those souls that I haven't spoken to. That he holds each of us accountable for. message this morning. James, you could have stayed 30 minutes a page. I wouldn't have cared. Don't let that clock ever stop you for doing what the Spirit lays on your heart. And you just preach as long as that Spirit tells you to. When it's a message like that. There's a world outside this door that was like the days of Noah. And we need to focus on the things we need to be doing for Christ, not on the things of this world. I thank the Lord that I'm able to be here this morning. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. But now I thank Him for allowing me the time to go out and live this message. Amen. Brother James, it's been a, a wonderful blessing to have you here this morning looking forward to next week love having the family here good to see you all love to see you all in the back there just just what a joy it is to worship our savior together let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed dear lord and heavenly father we just come before you lord just thanking you for your message lord thank you for the one that you laid upon his heart this message lord and i know that there's others that will still hear it. Lord, may they be as convicted as I was this morning. May they heed the words. It's not the words that Dickie gave to us this morning. It's the words the Spirit laid on his heart. And Lord, he spoke your words. With a conviction. With a desire. And with love. And Lord, may we take that message and use it this week. May we reach this world for you. May we rescue the perishing. 
one by one. Lord, may we go out and seek that lost sheep. Lord, it's gone astray. It's not going to come back. It's up to us to go find it. And may we go out and seek that sheep and rescue that one perishing. It's in Jesus' name we pray.